Come on in, you guys. We've got a brand new episode of Jimmy Rants in store for you here today. JimmyRants.com is the website. You want to engage live, you got to go follow me. I'm over on Instagram Live. And so over there, I am Livin' Low Carb Man, L I V I N L O W C A R B M A N. Once you are there, you can engage live in the content. We also simulcast live over here on my Facebook page. So thank you guys for being here today on. Jimmy Rants. If you missed the live, you can watch it on replay for up to 24 hours on Instagram. After that, they make it disappear, so pop on over to JimmyRants.com. That's where we house all the past episodes. We also put them up on YouTube, so shout out to all my YouTubers. Thank you for all the... I've got faithful followers that watch every single Jimmy Rants over on YouTube, so thank you guys for being here. Type in a keyword Jimmy Rants into a search at YouTube, and you will find the show. But speaking of YouTube, they are beginning to tick me off to no end because there is a lot of people, there are a lot of people, yes, I speak for a living and I said there is a lot of people. Uh, there are a lot of people who are sharing various opinions uh, from the medical perspective. So they're medical doctors, they're researchers, they're PhDs, they're scientists of some sort and it goes a bit against the grain of what you're hearing out there in the mainstream. And so there's quite a few of these doctors, especially working on the front lines with COVID-19, that are expressing various things that run counter to the narratives that were being fed in the media. And it's wonderful that we get these extra voices out there, we hear what they have to say, and then we can assimilate the information. And you guys know I'm all about people thinking for themselves and having all the full information and all the opinions put on the table. Now, granted, there's a lot of kind of wackadoodle things going on out there, people doing all kind of conspiracy theories and saying, take this and you'll be cured of COVID-19. I get that you're trying to squelch down all those things, uh, which I recently talked about the YouTube CEO uh, going on CNN and basically saying, hey, if you run counter to what we're saying, uh, at the World Health Organization about this, we're gonna take you down. Well, the unfortunate thing is that is now silencing some legitimate people that are credentialed that have things to say that are just contrarian opinions. And so it's quite disturbing in the United States of America, we have gotten to the point where if you don't fall in line with what the, the message is that's being put out there, the general message, the, the narrative, and you run counter to that in any way, that somehow you're being ostracized and censored. I'm gonna show on the screen here on Instagram Live uh, the, the, uh, one such video. This video right here, uh, Dr. Erickson. So he's been talking about uh, COVID-19, him and his colleague, and they made this one hour video. Go look it up, Dr. Erickson, COVID-19 full briefing. Uh, I think it's, uh, where is that, Bakersfield, Pennsylvania? I forget exactly where he's from. But they're medical doctors working on the front lines of COVID-19. And so they go on video and they share some really fascinating information, you guys. And that video got over 3 million views. And yesterday, YouTube decides to take it down because it violated their community standards. Now, that doesn't mean a damn thing. Violation of community standards in, in the repertoire of YouTube is, we don't like it, we're taking it down. And they don't have to give you any excuse as to why they take them down. They just take them down without any warning whatsoever. Well, the good news is we live in the day and age where people download the videos onto their laptop and if it gets deleted, 10,000 people have a copy of it and they're all uploading it again. So I don't know if they're gonna play you know, whack-a-mole trying to get all of these, but I just posted it on my Instagram uh, stories. So go to my Instagram page and look at my stories. You can swipe up and see it at least while you can. Otherwise, keep looking for it. I'm gonna try to grab a copy of it and throw it on jimmyrance.com for anybody that wants to see it. I know some people have put it up on IGTV and some other sources of uh, video formats where they don't delete things, but there is a huge, huge, huge problem right now with a lot of alternative voices that simply do not get heard because the powers that be do not want them 
to be heard. And it begs the question, what are we so afraid of having some alternative view that runs against the narrative that's being put out there? I mean, I get it. They're trying to prevent confusion. They're trying to prevent people falling for things. But guess what? That happens all the time. I get it. COVID-19, crisis, people getting sick, people dying. I get all of those things. But this is really no different than what's normally happening online. Why suddenly is censorship the ruler of the day, not letting dissenting voices be heard? So I have an article here today. This was published in statnews.com uh, by a couple of researchers. One is a hematologist, oncologist, and a professor of medicine at the Oregon Health and Science University. Vinay Prasad is his name. The other one is Jeffrey Flyer. He's an endocrinologist, also a professor of medicine and the former dean of Harvard Medical School. So these guys are not chump change when it comes to scientists. And they have a headline in their article here. Scientists who express different views on COVID-19 should be heard, not demonized. And we're seeing that again and again, that if you run counter to what they don't want you to know, to what the narrative is out there, if you run counter to that, you basically are being blacklisted right now. And we need an open scientific debate of ideas over COVID-19. It's so vital right now that we have these conversations and not silence voices. Guys, true science is looking at everything and then based on looking all the, at all the data, you come to the best conclusion based on that data. But if we're silencing some of the voices that might have keys to the puzzle here, how do you have all the data that you need? All right, let me read this. When major decisions must be made amid high scientific uncertainty, like we have right now with COVID-19, we can't afford to silence or demonize professional colleagues with heterodox views. Even worse, we can't allow questions of science, medicine, and public health to become captives of tribalized politics. Today, more than ever, we need vigorous academic debate. And it's so sad that two... Uh, people in the world of academia have to say this. And it's disgusting that we've gotten to the point where we would rather silence voices and keep the narrative that you want to believe rather than thinking, oh, maybe the narrative that's being put out there isn't exactly correct. Therefore, you go down a wrong path. And what if one of these dissenting voices says, you know what, um, this is wrong and here's why. And you give reasons. Think about it in another realm altogether. Think about the Supreme Court of the United States. There are nine justices on the Supreme Court. There are an odd number so that they can have, gee, I don't know, debate of ideas. And so when they make a decision, if it's a close decision, it's 5-4. And if it's a blowout decision, it's 9-0. But at least you had various people giving input. And the decision of the minority that doesn't pass is always called a dissenting opinion. And it gets published along with the majority opinion. The majority opinion obviously passes and it becomes the law of the land and the interpretation of the law. But the dissenting opinion is in there. So you at least see what were the issues at play there that people had concerns with. And that's what we need to be doing right now. We need to be hearing dissenting opinions and not squelching them, not censoring them, which is exactly what is happening. If you joined us late, there is this move because of COVID-19 that a lot of scientists that are running counter to the narrative that's being put out there, they're being demonized. And I just showed an example on uh, Instagram uh, and shows up on YouTube of this gentleman, Dr. Erickson, who he and his colleague are working on the front lines of COVID-19 and uh, they put out a whole one hour long video, wonderful video, go watch it if you can, but YouTube keeps deleting it. It had over 3 million views at one point and they were like, nope, this violates our community standards. No explanation of what that means, they just removed it. So this is what we're dealing with. So I've got a couple of scientists, uh, one from Oregon Health and Science University, uh, and the other one from Harvard, 
And so these guys are putting out the notion, we've got to let every voice in the scientific community be heard right now. To be clear, Americans have no obligation to take every scientist's idea seriously. Misinformation about COVID-19 is abundant right now, from snake oil cures to conspiracy theories about the origin of SARS-CoV-2. The virus that causes the disease, the internet is awash with baseless, often harmful ideas. We denounce these and some ideas and people can and should be dismissed. The problem is that line of delineation. Where do you cut off people making claims and where do you start listening to people? And yes, I'm a lay person who's been talking a lot about things around the edges of COVID-19, but I'm not telling you specifically things. If I'm reading an article, it's from a researcher, it's from a scientist, it's from a doctor. I'm not making these claims. And yet some people would say, well, you're not even allowed to do that. But even some scientists that are putting out uh, things, are they all with uh, above approach? I don't know. We're, and who gets to determine who gets to be heard and not? That's the problem right now. A lot of people are being basically shut out right now that really need to be heard. At the same time, we're concerned by the chilling attitude among some scholars and academics who are wrongly ascribing legitimate disagreements about COVID-19 to just plain ignorance or to questionable political or other motivations. And that's the problem. If it runs counter again to what the mainstream narrative is about COVID-19, they think you're just ignorant. And these are people that are not stupid. They have PhDs. They're very well educated in medical and science. Uh, basically, they've been out there a while talking about this, being on the front lines of this, researching this. These, This is their life. Are we supposed to think their opinion is less valid than those that are putting out the mainstream information about this? I don't think so. A case in point involves the response to a professor of medicine at Stanford, John uh, Ioannidis. He was thrust into the spotlight after he wrote a provocative article in STAT recently about COVID-19. He argued in mid-March that we didn't have enough information about the prevalence of COVID-19 and that the consequences of the infection on a population basis to justify locking down, he hypothesized, could have dangerous consequences of their own. Well, here's the thing. We're seeing some of the consequences of the lockdown. Uh, what is it? Last count, about 30 million people are out of work, unemployed because of this. A lot of small businesses are having to shut down. Pretty much life has been disrupted. Um, record numbers of people uh, are having to collect uh, a check from the government. I mean, it has literally been a self-fulfilling prophecy here. And yet, he's been ostracized. We have followed the dialogue about his article from fellow academics on social media. We've been concerned that they turn to personal attacks and generally disparaging comments. Uh, well, welcome to the internet. <laughs> I've been online for 15 years now, and you know you've arrived when you start getting haters and you start getting the negative attention. Trust me, I get my fair share. Uh, and so that is a part of the online world. But unfortunately, it doesn't matter who you are, they will come after you. While neither of us shares all of these views about COVID-19 that Dr. Uh, Ioannidis shared, we both believe that his voice and those of other scientists that are legitimate are important to consider even when we ultimately disagree with some of the specific analyses or predictions. And that's the thing, you guys. Let's don't shut out the voices. Let's listen to them, hear them out, and then let people form an opinion and a judgment call based on their, on their best knowledge and practices from their own experience that if it has legitimacy or not, simply shutting them out of the discussion does no good. Now, some people would say, well, you're wasting time listening to everybody who might have some cockamamie idea. And I agree, there should be some kind of a vetting process, but don't, don't doubt that they're just killing everything right now that runs counter to the main narrative. And YouTube themselves just last week said, if you run counter to what the World Health Organization is saying about COVID-19, 
we're going to delete your videos. And that's exactly what they've been doing, left and right. And behind the scenes, you guys, I am hearing from several of the various keto doctors that are working on the front lines of COVID-19. And they are doing Instagram Lives. They're trying to put things up on YouTube. And they're tr trying to share stuff that's way off of what they're saying in the mainstream. And every single time, their videos are being deleted. No explanation, just gone. So don't think that this isn't happening and it's happening rampantly. And we need to be aware of this. And it almost begs the question, why? Why are they not allowing dissenting voices to be heard? The last time I heard, that is one of the main tenets of being in America. And I know everybody that watches this isn't in America, but in America, we have the ability and, and the even the responsibility, I would say, to hear everybody out. Now, you don't have to pay attention to everybody, but at least hear what they have to say. Okay, that's interesting. And then we move on. Now, if it gets vulgar and it gets ugly, you know, obviously you don't have to engage in that, but ideas are not toxic. Ideas are just ideas. Say them in a kind way, put them out there, and then let people see what they think. And then let's have the debate and the discussion. An open debate is never a bad thing. Used to in America, an open debate was considered part of being an American. Now an open debate is, oh, you're a hater, you're ignorant, you don't know what you're talking about, you need to get back, you need to stay in your lane. Those kinds of things are what's being said now, and it's quite disturbing. We are two academic physicians with different career interests who sometimes disagree about substantive issues, but we do share the view that vigorous debate is fundamental to the existence of universities where individuals with different ideas who have a commitment to reason compete to persuade others based on evidence, data, and reason. And now is the time to foster, not to stifle, an open dialogue among academic physicians and scientists about the current pandemic and the best tactical responses to it, each of which which will involve enormous trade-offs and un unanticipated consequences. And they're right. We need to have the open debate. Let's stop pretending like the one narrative being put out there is the only possibility of what's happening here. Let's hear everybody. And who knows, maybe in those alternative voices, there's a nugget in there that we go, oh, we didn't think about that aspect. Yeah, let's implement it. And so this is why the debate of ideas is so crucial. And the moment we squelch alternative viewpoints is the moment we become mind-numb robots. And I don't know about you, but I'm a thinker. And I am always thinking. And I, I've kind of uh, become one of these I question everything kind of people. Um, and that can be healthy and unhealthy at the same time. If you question everything and something is solid fact, but you still question it, that could be unhealthy. But if you question things that are kind of eh, and right now a lot about this COVID-19 is definitely eh, uncertain, we need to be hearing other voices that could have alternative solutions to the questions that remain out there. Since COVID-19 first emerged at the end of 2019, thousands of superb scientists have been working to answer all the fundamental, vital, and unprecedented questions how fast does the virus spread? If it's left unabated, how lethal is it? How many people already have it? If so, are they immune? What drugs can fight it? What can societies do to slow it? What happens when we selectively evolve and relax public health interventions? Can we have a vaccine that will stop it? Should governments mandate universal masks? These are all the questions that scientists are trying to answer right now. And for each of these questions, there are emerging answers that we tend to share the consensus view. Without social distancing, COVID-19 would be a cataclysmic problem. Probably millions would be dying. The best current estimate of infection fatality rates is somewhere between 0.4% and 1.5%, varying substantially among age groups and populations. Some fraction of the population has already been infected by this and they've cleared the virus. For reasons that aren't yet totally clear, rates of infection have been much higher in Lombardy, Italy, and New York City than they have been in, in Alaska and San Francisco. 
So to date, no drug has been shown to be beneficial in any randomized control clinical trials, which is the gold standard in medicine. Scientists agree it will likely take about 18 months or longer to get a vaccine if they ever develop one. As for the masks, uh, we see arguments on both sides of this. So even these two scientists are acknowledging, okay, we've got a lot of things being put out there. Thus, we need to keep our thinking caps on. We need to kind of have people that are thinking outside the box. And quite frankly, we need dissent. Like, how do you know what you know and how do you know what you believe unless you hear the alternative viewpoint? Any debate class, and I've taken some in, my, in the past in college, I took a debate class. The first thing that gets you to do is to, you tell them your position on various issues and then they make you defend the opposite side position. What that does is it makes you learn and try to defend what another viewpoint that's totally different than yours is. It's an interesting mind stretch. Let's just put it that way. But the mind stretch is where you either solidify what you believe or you shift your thinking and you realize there's validity in some of the arguments of the other side. And that's beautiful, guys. And yet in the United States of America in 2020 over this COVID-19 thing, they want to silent dissent. What the hell? It's crazy. At the same time, academics must be able to express a broad range of interpretations and opinions. Some argue that the fatality rate is going to end up being very close to 0.2 or 0.3% when we look back at it over historical data. Others think it might even go below 1% substantially. Some believe that nations like Sweden, which instituted social distancing but had fewer lockdown restrictions, are pursuing the wisest course, uh, course at least for that country, while others favor strict lockdown measures as strict as possible. We think it's important to hear, consider, and debate all of these views without any kind of personal attacks or animus. Again, that is a product of being online. I've been online longer than 15 years. 15 years in the nutrition space. Before that, I was online, what was it, 10 years? I've been online since it almost came on. The internet was existed. I, I remember taking a, a internet... Uh, coding course where I had to do the HTTP colon backslash and all the all the stuff to make the code to put pictures way back when. Now they have everything automated. But um, yeah, so I've been online 25 years and yeah, it got really ugly once social media came on. YouTube was really bad. <laughs> Started putting things up on YouTube. You're the ugliest guy in the whole world. Gee, thanks. Um, appreciate that personal opinion. Um, Never mind what I was saying. They, it was just all these ad hominem uh, attacks that they're talking about here. And that's just the nature of online. So if they're worried about that, well, guess what? That's just a part of being online. Uh, but the animosity, if they could just take the personal stuff out and just express the view, that would be glorious. But unfortunately, Pandora's box is open there. You're not going to unclose that box that's been wide open for a while now. So, we do need the debate of ideas, which is what they're saying. COVID-19 has toppled a branching chain of dominoes that will affect health and survival in a myriad of ways. Healthcare is facing unprecedented disruption. Some consequences like missed heart attack treatment have more immediate effects, while others like poorer health because of economic damage or people eating lots of crappy garbage while they're stuck in their house and they're depressed are no less certain, but their magnitude won't immediately become evident. That's true. We don't know the health effect consequences, the societal consequences of all that we're going through right now until many more years and then looking back in hindsight. How many people, and this will be interesting, and, and I know some people have shared this opinion out there, and it's one of the ones that's being squelched right now, how many people are going to die from the consequences of the fear and the stress over COVID-19 versus the people that actually die, at least statistically speaking, and have COVID-19 on their death certificate? There have been people putting that out there, and yet those voices are being silenced too. 
And I tend to agree. I think there's going to be more ramifications of kind of an indirect consequence of COVID-19 and the fear and stress and uncertainty over it. All the people anxious, having heart attacks, da, 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 all of that. Are they going to count that in COVID-19 statistics somehow a, a non-COVID-19 death? But during the period of COVID-19, it's going to be interesting. But again, those voices aren't being heard. We're not hearing, oh, well, what we're doing is actually causing a lot of harm because they don't want you to know about that. They just want you to know about the deaths and the number of people getting this right now. And that's part of the problem. It's going to take years in the work of many scientists to make sense of all the full effects of COVID-19 and the responses we had to it. When the dust settles, few of any scientists, no matter where they work and whatever their academic titles, will have been 100% about the effects of COVID-19 and our responses to it. Acknowledging this fact does not require policy paralysis by local and national governments, which must take decisive action despite all the uncertainty. But admitting this truth requires a willingness to listen and to consider all ideas, even many that most initially think are totally wrong. You know, there was a time in our history where people thought the world was flat. They did. Flat earther, and there's a few of them still out there today, uh, but flat earthers, that was a huge one. And it wasn't until there were scientists that started going, whoa, 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 I, I, I don't think so. Like literally they thought ships would fall off the edge of the earth because it was flat. And that was a belief for a very long time. And even more recently in the 1950s, scientists and doctors thought smoking was healthy for you. And then they realized those people smoking were not improving their health. In fact, just the opposite. They were leading to lung cancer and other respiratory issues. So we don't always have the right narrative out there. And all these two guys in this story that I'm reading from are doing is saying, hey, look, we need to hear the alternative perspective because there might be nuggets of truth in them. A plausible objection to the argument we are making that opposing ideas need to be heard is that by giving false equivalency to incorrect ideas, lives may be lost. Aren't we losing lives anyway? Like, how, how, how are we losing lives because of information being put out there? Information is knowledge and knowledge is power and the power to reverse this trend. Let's not squelch voices if they have something to add. Scientists who are incorrect or misguided or who misinterpret the data might actually wrongly persuade others, causing more to die when salutary uh, actions are rejected or delayed. While we are sympathetic to this view, there are many uncertainties as to the best course of action. More lives may be lost by suppressing or ignoring alternative perspectives, some of which may at least in part ultimately prove to be correct. And again, there could be nuggets of truth in what's being shared from these alternative perspectives. Do we really want to silence these voices? I don't think so. I think it's all hands on deck right now. Let's see what the greatest minds in the academic and the medical and the research world have to say about this. Even if it runs counter to the narrative that's being put out there, show your evidence, make your case, and then let's add it to the discussion of ideas. Why is this so revolutionary? Like this, this to me is basic debate 101. Debate 101, it says, okay, this is a view. This is a counter view. There might be a middle view. Bring them all together and see if there's some kind of a consensus in all of it. Can you come to some conclusion, especially with something that's uncertain? That seems to me the most logical step in all of this. That's why we believe that the bar to stifling or ignoring academics who are willing to debate their alternative positions in public and in good faith must be very high. Since different states and nations are already making distinct choices, there exist many natural experiments to identify what is helping, what is hurting, and what in the end didn't matter. That's true. There's things we're not doing here in America that other countries are doing right now. And so, if you want to make the argument, well, Sweden's doing it the right way, well, let's take a look at Sweden. Let's look at all the data. Let's see what's happening. 
uh, account for like the specificity of what's happening there versus what could happen here if we did the same thing. Rather than just saying, well, it's working in Sweden, it'll work here, let's see all the things. But that's where scientists and, ac and academics are all needing to kind of step up and say, okay, we analyze the data, we kind of put it through the filter of what that would look like in America, and here's our proposal. Those are the ideas we need to hear. And they would be based on sound data and not just pulling it out of your keister. Society faces a risk even more toxic and deadly than COVID-19 that the conduct of science becomes indistinguishable from politics. Oh, science has become political now. It has with this COVID-19. If you run counter to what the main narrative is, and you're being shut out, those are like tactics that are deep within the political circles. And, and they're so right here. It's so become political. Why? Isn't the purpose here not political, but public health and trying to save lives and people? To me, that's what they need to be focusing on and they're dead right. Let's hear all the voices, at least from the academic world. The tensions between the two policy poles of rapidly and systematically reopening society, that is one end of things, versus maximizing shelter in place and social isolation must not be reduced to a political talk, but even as many, uh, many media outlets promote that it's just as simple as that. Well, this end of things, they want to open everything, and this end of things, they want to keep everything draconianly closed. It's not that simple. And it's not that easy, and yet we need dissenting voices to make the argument that not just one extreme or the other, but maybe there's some kind of consensus in the middle. Let's talk about that. These critical decisions should be influenced by scientific insights independent of your politics. Uh, they must be freely debated in the academic world without insult or malice. Uh, to the differing views. As always, it is essential to examine and disclose any conflicts of interest. Like if you're promoting a, uh, a supplement and you own a company that sells that supplement, yeah, you got a conflict of interest. Let's don't hear from those people. But if you've got patients that you've been uh, using some protocol on and it seems to be helping them with their COVID-19 and improve and da-da-da, then, and you have no interest in any of that other than the patient's well-being, okay, you're a voice that needs to be heard. And so if none are apparent or clearly demonstrated, talking about conflicts of interest, the temptation to speculate about malignant motivations must be resisted. Well, you must have some deeper agenda in sharing this that goes against the flow of the mainstream narrative. Not necessarily. I think we need to give people, especially scientists, academics that have been living and breathing in immuno immunology their whole careers, we need to give those people the benefit of the doubt that maybe they do have the best interests of the patients in mind and not any specific personal agenda that they're trying to promote. At this moment of massive uncertainty with data and analysis shifting daily, honest disagreements among academic experts with different training, scientific backgrounds and perspectives are both unavoidable and desirable. It's the job of all policymakers, academics, interested members of the public to consider differing points of view and decide at each moment the best course of action. A minority of view, even if it's ultimately wrong and mistaken, may beneficially temper excessive enthusiasm or put in needed caveats. This process, which reflects the scientific method, and that's a key in this too, the scientific method doesn't just say, this is my hypothesis and I'm going to do all I can to make sure my hypothesis is true. Uh-uh. Scientific method said, this is my hypothesis. Now let's do the experiment. Uh-oh, my hypothesis was wrong. Because now you see data that shows the opposite of your hypothesis. And in looking at this COVID-19 thing and all the narrative that's put out there, what if somebody sees data that runs counter to the hypothesis? You don't want to shut that out. That is, the, that is the essence of good science. And we don't need to be telling good scientists to stop doing good science. 
And the culture that supports it must be repeated tomorrow and the next day and the next. So repeatable, repeatable, repeatable. And if you see the same uh, result, why should that not be heard? Scientific consensus is important, but it isn't uncommon with some of the most important voices turn out to be those of independent thinkers whose views were initially doubted. That's not an argument for prematurely accepting any contestable views, but it is a sound argument for keeping them in at the table. So that's the thing, guys. Let's don't silence voices. In the United States of America, we are silencing people that have something to contribute. That, to me, is blasphemy. Literally, it's the antithesis of being American to silence people. No, we need to be hearing those people, again, people qualified, people with academics and background, that qualify them to have an alternative point of view. And if we start shutting out those voices, we lose United States. So let's just be honest about that. Why even have a free country if you're gonna silence people uh, irrespective of who they are? I think if we see that they're respectable scientists and we shut those voices out, shame on us. We need to have an open scientific debate of ideas over COVID-19 and that's vital right now right now. All right, I want to see what you guys have to say. We're going to come to Instagram Live first, and then we'll pop on over to Facebook Live if we have time. So welcome in, welcome in. JimmyRants.com is the website. Kelly says she likes my shirt. Yes, this is my orange. This is my low-carb crew shirt from a few years back, and I do love orange. Kind of makes me look like a pumpkin. Anna says, what happened to the freedom of speech? Well, exactly. Um, and this is the concern. It's like, let's have those voices out there and hear what they have to say. Cariana says, these guys are being uh, absolutely savage, talking about the guys that wrote this article. Uh, they're being savaged by other doctors and professional organizations. Uh, it is absolutely despicable. And again, all they're doing is saying, hey, let's don't censor voices that are making arguments that might run counter to what the mainstream narrative is but they have something to say. Let's hear them out. Kelly says, it's crazy. Uh, thanks YouTube, I already have a mother and I'll make my own choices, free speech man. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. BB says, thanks for all you do. Thank you, BB. I try to, I try to do some good work here on Jimmy Rants. And now, there it goes. Uh, Instagram was giving me a hard time there. Um. Nobody debates the other side anymore, says Rachel. Well, that's the problem. I mean, literally, we used to have this show in the United States on CNN in the early, late 80s, early 90s. I think it actually ran until about 2000 uh, called Crossfire. Literally, what they did was they took one side of an issue. Uh, someone took one side of a, a debate issue. The other one took the other side of the debate issue. And they had Crossfire. They did debate. There was no animosity. There was no personal attacks. It was all based on the ideas back and forth. You can't do that in 2020 anymore. Literally go on Facebook. Twitter is really bad. Go on Twitter and you you make a claim and within seconds, if it's a very controversial claim, you're going to get some kind of a personal attack against you. Oh, you're just stupid. And I get that a lot, by the way. Oh, you're just ignorant. You don't know what you're talking about. Da, 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 da. You fat, ugly asshole. You know, and you get that kind of stuff. And I get it literally every single day, but that's just kind of the decorum that we have now, sadly. Uh, Kat says the USA seems to be coming the USSR. Well, I don't know about that, but it, it is definitely uh, a little more concerning than it's probably been in a long time. Cariana says it's easier to rile people up if you inject emotion into an issue. Some find that very advantageous when seeking profit or power. Carry on, that is spot on. And uh, like the meat shortage thing yesterday, that was uh, intended, that, that I talked about yesterday on Jimmy Rants, that was intended solely to strike fear into the hearts of people. And when you've got people fearful, they act emotionally, and then you can take advantage of it. So you're, you're spot on there. We might not ever know the real death rate of COVID-19 for every death uh, where they test positive, 
they are being counted as COVID deaths, even if the death was from a stroke or heart attack. Well, that's to be determined, Rachel, but thanks to some people that have dissenting opinions, they've been saying that, you know, look, we need to kind of look at who is dying of COVID and seeing if they actually died of it or not. So there's gonna be a lot of uh, post analysis of the data, especially of the people that died once this is all over. And all of that should be vetted out. But if someone wants to make that uh, claim and put it out there from the scientific world and give evidence and data that supports their view, they should be heard, right? D. Bay says, excellent presentation. I've always said we may never see the curve of suicides, mental health, and other financial ruins. See, that is my concern too. Uh, and, and they add that it's gonna be tremendous. Uh, that's my concern too. I think some of the unintended consequences of locking us all down, uh, people becoming depressed, uh, people being anxious, um, and it causing health issues, and never mind all the crappy garbage people are stuffing in their mouth to no end right now, trying to deal. It's gonna have ramifications, not just months, but years to come. Mrs. Marvey says the key is taking into consideration the voices of those who are qualified, not just everyone shouting in the wind. Thank you. Yes, I agree. The line of delineation definitely needs to be those people that are academics and those people with medical credentials and research credentials. Those are the people that, and not all of them, warrant being heard if they're really off the deep end. But if it's something that seems somewhat rational, but even though it runs counter to the mainstream narrative, they're being rational and they got great data to present. And I've been sharing some of those things here on Jimmy Rants, then let's hear those people. Cupcakes, Curves, and Bella said, look, they took the outdoor man, Tim Allen, from TV over his politics. Well, yeah, that's a whole nother issue for a whole nother day, but you're right. Um, they will take action if you run counter to what the mainstream wants. All right, thank you, Instagram. Let's come over to Facebook. Hey, guys, see what you guys have to say about all of this. Come on in. All right, you have nothing. I guess it was very thoroughly explained over on Facebook. They're like, yeah, we got this. We, we, we hear what you're saying, Jay. But isn't it interesting that we don't wanna hear alternative views? And I think that is totally wrong. And these two guys, they nailed it. They nailed it that scientists who express different views should be heard. We should not be demonizing them. We should not be uh, calling them ugly personal attack names. And yet that's kind of part and parcel of how America works now. And I'm gonna show it one more time on the screen here on Instagram and YouTube, but right here, look up this video. I just posted a link on my stories to this Dr. Erickson, him and his colleague, uh, they uh, have basically put up this briefing all about COVID-19 and the stay at home order and how legitimate it is. They're on the front lines, COVID-19, and they're trying to offer an alternative perspective. And right there is their video. Again, I posted it on my stories, so go swipe it up. YouTube has deleted it. Uh, they had as many as 3 million views, and then it just got summarily deleted. So just be aware these kinds of things are happening out there and that we need to stand up for what's right. And what's right is hearing out all voices uh, from the legitimate uh, academia, research, and medical professionals. We need to hear those people, even if it runs counter to the mainstream narrative. That's it for this episode of Jimmy Rants. JimmyRants.com is the web website, as always. If you want to engage live in the content, go follow me. I'm over on Instagram at Livin Low Carb Man, L I V I N L O W C A R B M A N. Once you are there, engage live, just like all of these wonderful people did here today. We also simulcast over on my Facebook page. So thank you guys for being here today as well. If you missed the live, you can watch it on replay for up to 24 hours on Instagram after that. It does disappear. Pop on over to jimmyrants.com. We have all the past episodes archived there. You can also watch it on YouTube. Just type in a keyword search, Jimmy Rants. You will find the show. So guys, that's it for now. Until next time, we'll see you then.